Hello, good evening, uh, good afternoon, everybody, and uh, good evening or good morning, uh, wherever you are. Uh, so welcome to the very last uh, session of our new Education Normals webinar series of the year. Uh, of course, we are still planning for some in the next year uh, and till then. But uh, I think today is a great honor to invite uh, Dr. Nancy Law uh, from Hong Kong to give us a speech, which I think that is actually very much quite uh, aptly uh, suitable for the end of the year, because uh, after one whole year's uh, pandemic, uh, it's time for us to actually look back to see what happened uh, and in the rest of the world, or how, how uh, the educational uh, sector are actually handling, uh, dealing with uh, the pandemic. Uh, so Dr. Nancy Law is a professor in the Faculty of Education at the University of Hong Kong. She served as the founding director for the Center for Information Technology and Education for 15 years from 1998. She also led the Science of Learning Strategic Research Team at the University of Hong Kong. She's a fellow of the International Society of the Learning Sciences and is known globally for her strong records and expertise in the integration of digital technology in learning and teaching promote student-centered pedagogical innovations. She has been invited to serve as expert consultant on various tasks and projects related to technology-enhanced learning by local and international agencies during the European Commission including the European Commission, UNESCO, and OECD. Uh, so without further ado, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Law to share with us uh, her, her finding on her one of the broad, large scale study, survey study on what happened in Hong Kong education sector uh, during the past half a year. Please. Thank you, Longshang, for the very nice introduction. And um, as Longshang has said, um, good morning, good afternoon, uh, or good evening. We don't really know. Um, but uh, anyway, uh, it's really a good, um, uh, well, I'm very pleased to be able to meet with, I think, probably primarily colleagues from Singapore um, to share with uh, you uh, what we have been doing in Hong Kong, and particularly our team at the University of Hong Kong, in collaboration with colleagues at the Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. Um, um, you know, uh, in terms of, um, first of all, we had been studying uh, learning and assessment for digital citizenship, and then um, later on, we now move, um, we have included an additional project called e-citizen education, 360. And um, for this particular uh, session, I'm going to give you a brief overview. And in particular, I want to share, it's not only that we have been doing research, but how this research can actually help um, teachers and school leaders, uh, as well as the broader community in facing the um, COVID-19. So um, well, this is a slogan that we have heard from, well, the end of January until now. So we've been having uh, different periods of suspending schools, but not learning. Uh, this is a slogan that the um, Hong Kong government um, keeps talk, uh, telling us. And um, we've just been experiencing the fourth spike. And yesterday, there was an announcement that uh, schools should be uh, suspended from Wednesday until the, until the end of this year. So we actually, probably globally, Hong Kong schools have experienced the longest period of um, school suspension. So until now, we have more than 100 days. And of course, it is totally unexpected and a step change for everyone involved. So one question we want to ask is whether it is working. Do students are they learning? And how well are we prepared? So in a way, what I'm, I would be um, sharing with you is also 
a focus that we um, have been looking at is whether we are prepared for online learning. Um, and the preparation is not just teachers, but it's also schools and students and parents. Um, the story has to go back a little bit because um, we started conducting a study called learning and assessment for digital citizenship. It's, it was designed as uh, a longitudinal study um, spanning five years. And the, start, the project started at the end of 2016. And the first wave of data collection was done uh, in the, from December 2018 to April 2019. And um, it's quite a comprehensive um, study with um, different um, surveys and, and also um, an assessment of digital literacy as well as collaborative problem solving. But what I'm going to um, focus on today is the digital literacy part because this is actually an important part of students' pr um, preparedness for benefiting from online learning. And we, for this study, we actually targeted um, three age groups of students, primary three, secondary one, and secondary three. Um, the assessment framework that we uh, adopted is a very uh, popular one um, by the um, European Commission. It's called DICCOM. So within this DICCOM um, framework, there are five dimensions in terms of digital literacy or digital competence, information and data literacy, communication, collaboration, digital content creation, digital safety, and problem solving using ICT. And what do we find? We find that students in Hong Kong are able to do basic tasks in all five dimensions. So they do have some basic literacy. But then if we look uh, deeper, then we find that in fact, um, some of the more complex tasks, they would, they are not, many of them are not able to do, for, such as formulating complex search for highly relevant results, uh, adapting their communication strategy to the context and also to protect the digital identity, um, to be able to identify, to be able to use media and not violate intellectual property rule, uh, rights, and so on. So, so there are limitations to what our students were able to do. And the instruments that we, um, that we use were actually developed by ourselves. And I think, I, I don't actually know that there are other groups um, globally who has actually uh, done assessment of digital literacy where you can actually compare the performance of students across a wide range of ages. In our case, because we wanted to uh, look at how students' um, digital literacy differ across age groups and also how they change over time, because the study that we have designed is actually a longitudinal panel study. So um, we, in Hong Kong, randomly uh, selected schools from four regions in Hong Kong uh, so that they have a good coverage of, um, you know, different SDS um, backgrounds. And we had, uh, so what you see here on the screen is um, our, our, our box plots. So the box plots, the blue ones on the left hand side, each box plot is um, the distribution of students scores um, in a school, in a primary school, those are the blue ones. And on the right hand side are pairs of pink and green box plots. Each pair is, uh, uh, is sampled from the same school. The pink ones are the secondary one and the green ones are the secondary three. And in each of the, the schools that we have um, selected, uh, we random sample um, two classes from the same grade. Okay, so as I said, because we were, so we actually had a, a very nicely uh, sort of um, 
uh, scaled instrument. So what what you see here on this graph, the zero is in fact the mean of um, the digital literacy performance for all students from primary three to secondary three. And um, the blue, so for the blue box plots, the mean was negative 0.76. So that is the mean for the secondary three, uh, the primary three students. And then for the uh, secondary schools, the mean for all the students, secondary one and secondary three combined was 0.43. So we can see very clearly that, that the secondary schools um, students are on average um, more, more highly digitally literate compared to the primary students. Um, but then if we look at each pair of the um, of the box plots, then the secondary three students are only marginally higher than the secondary one. And in fact, you can see that some of the green uh, box plots are in fact lower than the pink ones. So that means in some cases, the secondary three perform less well than the secondary one. So, um, and then another observation we we see is that we can there is a huge between school and within school um, performance difference. So within each school, you can see that you know there can be um, because one is in fact one standard deviation. So you can see the weakest and the um, and the strongest. They have you know, more than some of them would have, some schools will have more than three standard deviations. And um, also you can see that um, the within school, so you can, uh, sorry, you can also see that say for the most right-hand uh, blue box, the mean for that primary school is almost zero. So it's almost reaching the average score of the secondary students. And in fact, this class, I mean, these two classes of students, they are actually performing higher than some of the secondary um, uh, schools, um, secondary three students even. So one can actually um, consider what does it mean if these students are to be pushed into online learning? This is, this is actually what happened. So it's like, say, if you have students, it's not just a single student, it's a whole, whole classes of students. So if you are teaching students in secondary three, say, and you find that your students' language ability is actually weaker than the primary three students, what would it mean for you as a teacher, right? So this is uh, a serious problem. And we find that in fact, the digital literacy score is not only affecting the performance or, well, we were projecting it would affect their academic performance if they are going to be learning primarily through online means or digital means. And also we find that the digital literacy score, if we correlate with um, the findings from the student surveys, and then we find that the digital literacy score is uh, positively correlated with uh, better online safety awareness, and then also negatively correlated with the cyberbullying experience. So we see that there is a cumulative effect of three types of digital divide. I've discussed the digital literacy divide but there is also a, an access divide. We find that although most of the students, I think more than 95% of our students, uh, even primary three students, would be able to access the internet from home. But that is using a smartphone. So most, so nearly everyone would be able to access the internet through using a smartphone. But then there is about 10% of the students who do not have access to large 
uh, display devices at home. Now, what does that what does that mean? Large display devices include tablet computers, laptop computers, and desktop computers. But in the case of Hong Kong, because the living spaces tend to be very uh, well, very limited. So usually, um, people who uh, would not use uh, desktop computers at home usually now. So it would be either laptop or tablets. And for the for the so 10% do not have access to large display devices. And then of the remainder about 50% would have access. I mean, so 90% would have access at home, but half of them would have their own sole access, whereas others would have to share. So you can see that there is some variation across um, the um, grade levels in terms of the students access at home, but the difference is not too great. So one question we asked was how far the students um, ability to access internet um, using a large screen device, say if you're having a, an online lesson, then do you, whether you have a, a large screen or not, would it matter? Well, we find that it does matter, but it's not so simple. If we look at the primary three students, then the best performing group was in fact the group that had shared access only to uh, a large screen device. Whereas the students who do not have access at all to large screens or those who have so access, the performance was not different at all. They were basically the same. For these secondary three students, the picture is totally different. It's clearly those who have so access who have the highest um, that group has the highest uh, digital literacy score. And for the secondary one, then in fact, the difference is, is still the group that has shared access who has the highest performance, but it is not statistically significant anymore. So one may ask, why is this so? We have a hunch, you know, for a primary three child, how would they know how to use a large screen device to learn and not just to play a game? So, so having a shared access means that they can be modeling or watching or observing or being taught um, how to use the large screen device. So that means it's not only the digital access, but also the family support um, would matter a lot. So, and we see that, you know, from the survey of the students, then actually how much support they can get from their parents differs um, greatly. So our key finding in relation to online learning is that the student, um, there is what we call a student level preparedness for online learning, and it comprises adequate digital competence access to large screen devices at home, and also family support on the use of digital technology. So we actually um, announced, uh, launched this results um, um, to the public. So we held a press conference in April um, to um, talk about the results that we found. And it, because it was in the midst of the, um, well, the school suspension due to the pandemic. So uh, it caused a lot of community, um, you know, attention and people were discussing and asking, so what would it mean? And actually I've received a lot of, um, you know, questions from different groups and the community asking me, so what should we do now? How can we help the students? who are not really, uh, who are actually struggling because we do hear a lot of stories about students struggling with uh, online learning. So, so the response I had was, well, 
I don't know, because of course I can give you some responses, you know, as a kind of like uh, intuitively what could, uh, could be helpful. But then we don't know what actually happened during the period. And so, so, so I was stupidly saying that, well, if, you, I, if I were to be honest, I would say we need more research. And then I then now learn that don't tell people what you really wish, because you may get what you wish for. So we were able to, we, I mean, we said that, and then we actually were very fortunate. We had people who come forward and said, okay, what can we do? We really want to see this happen. So can we help you? And so we were very lucky to have um, uh, support from the community. Um, of course, it's funding, but it's not just funding, but also um, from a lot of different um, com professional and communities and NGOs and so on. So, so we had people um, who, I mean, we have the professional teachers associations, the pr professional principal associations, as well as um, say the Boys and Girls Club and the Hong Kong Playgrounds Association, both of which have, um, you know, youth services as a main um, focus of their work as a social service NGO. And um, so we wanted to capture very quickly what was, um, uh, what might be the situation. So we started preparing the study in May. And then, so we started the data collection in mid-June and we finished in mid-July. So the last day of the data collection was in fact, July 14. So when we launched the, the study, we were um, towards the end of the first school suspension period. And so we wanted to capture, so we wanted to uh, launch the data collection when the students go back to school. So that was when they just go back to school. And then, so we thought they would then have a smooth transition until uh, summer vacation. But in fact, uh, unfortunately, we had to have um, uh, an earlier summer vacation as well. So, and when we work together with our um, uh, colleagues and friends on this new education, uh, e-citizen education 360, um, we decided it has to be what we call an action oriented study. Um, we want to engage community partners to interpret and make aligned efforts to support learning at all levels. So we want to work together to co-invent the new normal. So, the, so people ask me, what does 360 mean? I said, well, 360 means it is a very comprehensive uh, study. But it's also 360 because we are involving uh, a wide range of community support. And at the same time, we want our action orientation, orientation to be 360, uh, to be taken up by our um, friends and colleagues. So we, with the support that we received from the community, we were able to, within that very short period of time, um, and also when the schools were just going back uh, into operation, uh, we had 53 schools and we had six, uh, more than 6,000 6, students. And I think we had uh, 800 something teachers and um, about 500 school leaders. And, the, uh, and we actually also have um, uh, several hundred parents also, um, I think more than a hundred, I forgot the exact number, but we do have um, quite a large number of parents also responding. And the distribution of schools is actually quite um, even across the territory. But I have to um, uh, warn you that actually this is not a random sample because we simply don't have the time to do to do random sampling. It was um, we invited all schools that uh, use the local, uh, so we call the local schools. They're not international schools. So all local schools are invited, and they uh, they uh, participate in uh, well on a voluntary basis. 
uh, and they also the school decide how many students, which classes, uh, which grade levels, and so on. So so far, we have already launched three um, uh, research uh, bulletins. So because we wanted the findings to be um, provided to the community in a timely manner, so that um, schools and um, and teachers and other people can actually uh, take advantage of the findings and make uh, preparations for learning and teaching appropriately. And so remember, we we finished at in July 14. So we wanted, so we don't want to wait a year to you know to release the results. So we actually staged the uh, research questions and release the findings step by step. So the first um, bulletin was released on uh, July 20. So, and then the second one was August 25, just before the, the new, academic, uh, new school year. And then uh, the third one was uh, released on November 3rd. So what do we find? So the first bulletin, we have three questions. So the first one was that the, so what was the impact of online learning? Well, a, a good finding was that the efforts of schools and parents to sustain learning actually paid off. Uh, the parents, the teachers and the school leaders all when asked say that they don't think that the school suspension is going to have long term uh, impact, negative impact on the students. And in fact, there appears to be some kind of a silver lining from it. So um, all of the respondents would say that, including the students themselves, say that they have improved in the digital skills. Um, and, the, and the school leaders actually have the highest rating in terms of um, the, their teachers' uh, improvement in digital skills. But uh, we also find that, I mean, this is a hunch that we had from the, uh, from the first study that I reported. And we do see that the social uh, economic divide takes a toll on the students. So uh, we were asking students about their levels of stress, uh, about you know different things, and we find that the for the for the primary school students the levels of stress is not too high, um, and uh, there isn't um, too. I mean, there's no statistical difference between the high SES students and the low SES students, but for the secondary students there is a significant difference um, between um, low SES and high SES. And the, this, and the increased uh, stress, um, you know, I mean, the relatively higher stress is in all the areas of stress. So um, we also want to find out whether there is any school level of uh, difference uh, in terms of um, uh, what the, st the students may experience, both the positive or negative aspects of online learning. And one um, indicator, because I mean, we only had a very short period of time. So we only use one indicator at the school level. Something uh, is something we call bring your own device, BYOD in Hong Kong. Now, what does that mean? In fact, the BYOD is a scheme not by the Education Bureau, but by the Social Welfare Department in Hong Kong to provide um, mobile devices. I mean, this large screen device, it could be a laptop, it could be a, um, a tablet uh, for the students to use um, at home and to be able to bring to the um, uh, to school for learning at school. So, so why does it, so the, the issue is 
although it is uh, a, so it's a means test to provide these devices to students but the government actually wanted the schools to actually make use of these devices because if the students have these devices but the schools are not using it it's actually not serving the educational purpose so so the so the schools so the students can only have these uh, devices if the school applies to be in the scheme, in the BYOD scheme. And for the school to be able to apply to, for being in the BYOD uh, scheme, they need to provide a plan um, to the Education Bureau to explain why, so what would be the kind of usage that they want the students to, to use for, with their devices. And, and I think in a way this is nice because also because if the schools is having that kind of plan, then this, they can also recommend the configuration of the devices and so on. But that also means if you can look at this, um, the pie charts, then actually there are many schools who asked who were not uh, participating in the, um, in the BYOD um, scheme and why there can be many different reasons and one of the reasons actually as far as i understand is that some teachers would not want students to have their own devices <clears throat> when they were in class because they think that they're not they would be losing control so um <clears throat> so but we find that for the schools, for the students in schools that are in this BYOD scheme, they actually perform better. I mean, performing better meaning that they claim that they are learning better and uh, they have uh, learned better skills and they have less stress. And also the teachers are also reporting, um, you know, better um, teaching experience and so on. So. So we had uh, rec three recommendations, um, you know, on what to do. And importantly, um, we talk about school level preparedness. Uh, we suggested that the schools should have a comprehensive e-learning plan, which not all schools have. And so there's a diversity. We also recommend community efforts and partnership. So how do we go about doing this um what we call uh action oriented uh 360 support so at the end of every press conference we would organize a seminar which might be on the same day or on a different day so in this case it was a week after our press release we organize um a seminar for school leaders and teachers and the speakers are basically, for this first one, we have six speakers, um, two from primary schools, one um, teacher and one principal and one from, uh, and, and two from secondary schools. And we also had uh, two from the NGOs. So I'm, so I'm showing you very, um, uh, very quickly, you know, what was the kind of things that they talk about. Now, when we say we need the school, so our recommendation is a very high level recommendation, say, for example, the, the school should have a comprehensive e-learning plan. But what would it mean? How does it look like? So we have um, the principals and, and the school teachers explaining what they have been doing, um, you know, with the online uh, learning and how that sort of connects with what they have been doing before. And so they talk about some guiding principles, the plans, and, and so on. And they even um, talk about what they were planning uh, for the new um, school year, because you know there was summer vacation. We don't know whether we, we were able to, we will be able to uh, start um, September, you know, with everybody back in schools. And in fact, it was, it, uh, we could, so it was, I think, about two or three weeks after, um, about three weeks into the new uh, school year, then slowly the, the students go back to school. So they talk about various uh, possibilities in terms of what the new normal would be and how um, 
they were planning to support the students, the teachers, and the parents. Uh, we and we we don't want to see it as a kind of like a, a formula of what to do, but we were asking schools that were well prepared to share what they were doing. So they were seeing different formats of how um, the, the schools were going about it and also the rationale and the conditions that are needed for these to work. We also had, say for example, these were some of the slides that the um, Hong Kong Boys and Girls Clubs were um, uh, sort of sharing because they've been actually um, um, supporting uh, schools and students. So, so they were publicizing and they were strengthening, in fact, they were strengthening their work in terms of supporting uh, students' digital competence. They were supporting parents um, on how they can support the students in terms of uh, online uh, means of working and, and so on. And they and say this is the, uh, uh, the presentation by colleagues from the uh, Hong Kong Playgrounds Association uh, talking about how do we detect um, cyber bullying and what we, we um, can be done and what kind of programs they have for schools and uh, for schools and for um, students. And then the second bulletin, we focus on um, the issue of actually what schools actually do. What do we mean by online learning preparedness? So we ask, so one of the surveys was in fact asking each school to um, we were requesting each school to uh, recommend their e-learning or ICT coordinator. And so that coordinator survey um, would contain a lot of information about how e-learning was um, being uh, organized in the school. And so we had the focal um, uh, data was in fact from the ICT coordinator. And we tried to look at the information about e-learning, um, how that might relate to the teacher and the student survey uh, responses. And first of all, we, we do find that the teachers, so at the school level, um, you know, because we're not able to match it, uh, each child with the teachers that teach them, but we were able to look at the correlation between the teachers' responses and the students' responses at the school level. And we find that what the teachers respond to say if they, so what they do in terms of what they say they were doing in terms of, a, of a online learning and the use of the technology were positively correlated with the students' responses. So the teachers' preparedness matters. And then how do they organize? So we actually ask about the team structure and we ask schools, um, you know, who in your school, I mean, what kind of positions have, are in, involved in the school's e-learning support? And we listed seven different roles and we find that there's a huge difference. In one school, there was only, only two people were involved and they were both IT technicians. Whereas in some other schools, I mean, the, the maximum was more than 20 people, and they have all seven types of people within the team. And so the, the number of people involved and also the, the roles are, are different. And also what, what does the team do? These are the various kinds of um, uh, features, and they differ widely as well. And depending on who are involved, then we find that there are different kinds of functions that the team could serve. And there are huge variations in terms of the priority given to uh, different things. And so when we look at the correlation at the school level, again, we find that all these features are positively um, correlated with both the teachers and the students' experiences. So what did we um, recommend? Um, so we, we see that at the school level, uh, we see three uh, different kinds of preparedness. 
And one, we need multi-level, multidisciplinary leadership team. We need to strengthen the learning management system because the teachers, many of them were only using Zoom. That is not enough. And then they, uh, we want we want the schools to provide diverse forms of teacher professional development. So, but just putting these forward doesn't help. So we were again getting the teachers and, and the principals to share what they actually do in their own schools. For example, this is one of the, um, the, the e-learning coordinator in one of the primary schools. And so she explained how in their school, how they have actually developed their e-learning strategies from 2014 until 2020. And they and she gave a very detailed explanation how they structured the, the team within the whole school archi, um, administrative architecture. And then they they talk, she talked about having two different teams, a smaller team on the technical side, and then a bigger team on e-learning development. And they have a very sophisticated e-learning development team where they have, uh, and in at the core, you have sub, from each subject panel, one coordinator into this e-learning development team. And then that development team also communicates with the school curriculum um, uh, development team. And each subject also have their own um, panel and each panel will also discuss about how they do their e-learning and so on. And they have principles on how the uh, team should be structured. And so, and then the third one is about, you know, how teachers uh, practice and perception. Um, I mean, how, so what constitutes teachers uh, preparedness? And we find that in fact, um, using um, the survey, we find that we particularly four factors. Um, we can categorize teachers into four um, groups. So the most, uh, one group we call the progressive innovators, they form about 20%. Um, and then one group we call cautious explorers, conservative explorers and traditional instructors. So if you look at the chart, the main difference is two. One is the, you know, whether before the, um, on, before the pandemic, how important the teacher sees um, the priority they give to student-centered pedagogy. Uh, and it's the progressive innovators who were the most uh, pos positive on that. And then another factor is um, whether they think that after the school resumption, uh, whether online learning should still take place. And, and so of course that would be for reasons like um, catering for learner diversities and, and so on. So we also do uh, structural equation modeling, and we find that if we look at whether the teacher's attitude towards online learning even after the pandemic, then we find that the teacher's uh, you know, experience of using online platforms and resources for interactive learning online, as well as the self-efficacy would be important. And then what is very interesting is that the teacher's sharing and collaborating on online uh, pedagogy. Um, so, so in fact, the, you know, if we want the teachers to be moving towards being a progressive innovator, what, what needs to happen? Well, school matters, so school leadership matters. So the teacher's ability, experience of sharing and collaboration for online pedagogy um, is the primary influencing factor. We also did a uh, item difficulty map looking at you know what were more difficult for the teachers and we find that it is um, using digital technology for assessment uh, feedback and also for improving uh, teaching and so we had recommendations on how teachers can um, on uh, teacher collaboration and so on and again we asked the teachers to uh, share the experiences and so they, they give a very vivid picture of what they do within the school regarding all these different recommendations. And so, um, so through these, 
we had very active discussion. A lot of um, people uh, were in attending, and so 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 we are hoping that it is not only the virus that spreads, but it's also uh, good ideas that spread. So so we we are using this as a platform for stimulating a learning epidemic for co-inventing the new normal. So um, thank you very much. I'm sorry, I overran a little bit. Okay, so um, I will be very happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Law. Uh, I think it's actually fine that uh, if, uh, later we'll overshoot a little bit if, uh, if uh, the, the responses from our uh, audience good. Um, yeah, I think uh, this is really a very uh, interesting and inspiring research and I find it uh, it's so rigorous that uh, actually you identify all the relevant indicators uh, uh, of uh, this uh, uh, e-learning preparedness, readiness, student readiness, digital literacy, uh, all the way from not only from students but also from teachers and go from, from the schools and go uh, and, and see how they are actually correlated. Uh, okay, thank you very much. I think uh, that's probably uh, all for today. Uh, so I, I wonder whether our team would like to share, uh, flash uh, the slides for the feedback form. Uh, uh, yes, I, 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 can, uh, I can send the slides. Yeah. Yeah, I can yeah. send the slides to, to you and, uh, Thanks. So if and any, then you can, uh, you can share, yeah. Yeah, so if everybody wants it, uh, yeah. Okay. And also I think the link is also, the link you mentioned just now is also in the slides. Yeah, because oh, yeah, yeah, I yeah. got it in, in both the QR code and then the uh, yes, yes, the, the last slide. Yes. Yeah, it was last slide. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Hey, yeah. okay. thanks a lot. Uh, so uh, would uh, our audience, uh, please, uh, for those are still with us, uh, could you please uh, uh, give us a feedback and hope that we can improve our series in the future. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, and and I enjoyed it. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. That was very okay. yeah, inspiring. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you, everybody. Bye.